It is a real honor for me to deliver um, the TS Sound Drum Oration. The COVID-19 pandemic gave me the time, the space to think about Dr. Soundram, to reflect on her work, uh, and more importantly, to be able to present it to you, um, the wonderful students of Gandhi Gram University, 10,000 of you. Um, I am grateful to the Vice Chancellor, to Dr. Pankajam, the former Vice Chancellor who instituted this oration, to the Department of Home Science, uh, and every faculty of Gandhi Gram University for this opportunity. This beautiful image of Dr. Soundram brings back so many happy memories, happy memories that were made by a 10 year old girl when she arrived at Gandhi Gram of her leadership, of her beauty, of her, her ability to be there for everyone, but also I think uh, her tremendous um, uh, experience that leaves a lasting impression in this generation, but I'm sure in generations to come. This is a, a summary of the oration that I delivered on the 10th of December. Uh, and I hope it will, it will bring you and draw you um, to Dr. Soundram's life a little bit more. I know there are a few resources online and therefore this is a contribution to that. But I think there is a, a body of work that she has left behi behind. And with Gandhi Gram University, we can present it to, uh, to the students, but also to everyone who is interested in how Mahatma Gandhi inspired so many leaders uh, to build a new, uh, to serve society and to leave lasting impressions. Um, Dr. Soundram, of course, was a multi-dimensional personality, leaving her footprint on so many different aspects of work, both at Gandhi Gram and uh, in this wonderful nation of ours, India. Um, she has layered uh, so many different aspects of our own particular expertise into these footprints. But for the oration today, I would like to draw on two things, her pioneering leadership as well as her public health experiments, which have an impact uh, in modern India and a connection to the current crisis that we are part of, the COVID-19 crisis. Allow me, therefore, uh, in, this, in this presentation, which is a summary of the oration, um, to go deeper into the COVID-19 pandemic. Allow me also um, to look at Dr. Soundram's uh, life and legacy through these two lenses of leadership and, and what leadership means to society, as well as the importance, the critical importance of investing in public health. Um, I will, of course, then look at the lessons that we can take as professionals and budding professionals in building leaders for tomorrow, as well as, I think, very importantly, um, to be able to celebrate the human being that I had the deep honor um, to call a party. You know, this, this, this image of wearing masks everywhere is something that I was not used to as a medical student, you know. It was very much in the, in the realm of the intensive care unit, the infectious disease unit where we use masks. But you know, now in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, everybody is wearing it. It was something that we never imagined uh, and something that I'd like you to keep in the backdrop as we look at the data. Um, almost every country, 200 countries and have been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. When I first started writing an academic piece in March of 2020, only five 500,000 people were affected. Today, as I deliver the oration, almost 70 million people have been affected. So it is a pandemic with all the characteristics of a public health pandemic, the scale, the depth, the spike, and the height of people uh, who've been affected. But I think what I'd like to do in this backdrop is to see how this has affected individuals and communities. So may I draw upon the socio-epidemiological model of health promotion that we use so many times in public health? If I may again place the child in the center, 1.5 billion children have been affected one way or the other. And look at the circles of influence, you know, the most intimate being family, then being community where schools and hospitals are situated. And you keep widening and increasing the layers uh, around this individual child and you will see you will end up in policy. Every single aspect of this model has been affected in the COVID-19 um, crisis. Party knew this, Dr. Soundram knew this even the, in the 1940s and therefore her work layered in all these different ways um, from, from modeling and practice at Gandhi Gram to policy through the union government um, in New Delhi. You know, this, this graph is another one that always speaks to me. 
uh, on the very top you see the pediatric population the number of children in Uttar Pradesh the most populous state of India is equivalent to the child population or the pediatric population of United States of America come right down you see Orissa where Dr. Kalpana Raja comes from, uh, somebody from a wonderful family inspired by Mahatma Gandhi. And you see on the right, you see Kenya, the entire pediatric population. That's the scale of things. And no wonder did Dr. Soundram choose uh, women and children as her forte, her, her area of focus and, and work. You know, when I speak of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's not as if the virus alone has caused this crisis. There's been predisposing factors. Let's take the lens of our and, and look at the economic growth in the last decade. We've gone from 5% uh, to 8.5%, but the wealth that we have generated has not been equally distributed. You know, still about 14% officially of India's population is below the poverty line. But those of us who work closer to the community also know that the impacts are much more than this 14%. Look at another way. I mean, if you kind of go beyond uh, the economic growth rates and you look at uh, uh, using another lens of social stratification, which is the caste system, you see again the distribution is very skewed, it's very uneven. Um, you know, uh, traditionally uh, sections of society that have been ostracized and marginalized still receive a small portion of this wealth that we have generated. And the ones who've always had access get a bigger share. Now this unequal distribution of course comes with a cost. We can also look at it in the way young children are growing up today and if you take one aspect that determines their growth which is nutrition and you again look and analyze as to where um, the nutritional achievements have been have been fast and good it's again the wealthier uh, percentile the poorest section have still remained uh, very undernourished you know i just read an article yesterday which which is describing the deepening crisis as far as nutrition is concerned in india and the nfhs surveys present that to you go ahead and then look at it also in the way of of another very important public health intervention which is immunization and you can see the stark um, difference again you know the most educated the most empowered the ones that have resources at their disposal sometimes end up being immunized almost to about 75 percent by 80 percent you're hitting herd immunity we know this the, the discussion um, around covid is speaking about herd immunity but we have poorer sections of our society where even now only one third a little above 30 percent are immunized adequately so you know they are predisposing factors and they are the current factors that have emerged out of this massive disruption through the COVID-19 pandemic that has led to this, uh, I think, this, this context uh, that, that is worrisome. We do know that the World Bank and the IMF says about 130 million people will drop into poverty during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic. 50%, 50% are going to be children. These are children who are growing up today, their brains are formed, their bodies are formed. And if it is a scarred childhood, we know it will be a compromised adulthood. Therefore, the first part of my presentation describing the context is more than a public health crisis. There's a learning crisis, there's a nutritional crisis, there's a mental health crisis, and we know there is a severe economic crisis, which people say will take more than two to three years to recover fully. Um, I would like to move on to a quick timeline you know I'd like to look um, at, at uh, Dr. Soundram's uh, personal life and, and leadership trajectory Mahatma Gandhi said at one time leadership meant you know power muscle power but today he said it is about getting along with one another and you know getting along with one another is not just between two people it's also what you feel about yourself how empowered how confident you feel in interacting with the others dr soundra was born in 1904 uh, in the tvs family in madurai a loved daughter of this family she grew up and as was the tradition of the day she was married off at age 14 to a medical doctor and um, less than a decade into her marriage she lost her husband because he succumbed to plague as he was taking care of patients affected by plague but it could have been just possible that she would have stayed at that time and done what the times of the day and, and the culture of that time dictated which is living the life quietly in her own family but her parents encouraged her 
the momentum in India was for girls and women to be empowered and to be greater participants in India's progress and freedom struggle. So Dr. Soundram found her way to the medical school in New Delhi, the Lady Hardinge College. She found a wonderful hostel mate in Dr. Sushila Nair, um, again someone who was greatly influenced by Mahatma Gandhi. And these two wonderful women did not, became not only um, uh, medical doctors, great public health pioneers, but they went on to serve the government of India. Now, in 1930, when Dr. Soundram joined the freedom struggle and was inspired by Mahatma Gandhi, I think she started forming that aspect of her that evolved later as a very visible public leader. She also saw the problems not only in the immediate circumstance of Tamil Nadu, but started looking at it in, in a much wider um, uh, framework. You know, the country was really her, her laboratory uh, for her to draw on. And when India won independence in 1947, Mahatma Gandhi asked some to join the government and invited many to lead experiments across the country of what that vision of integrated rural development could look like. And Dr. Sandra was asked to start something in rural Tamil Nadu. So there were the seeds of Gandhi Gram. She came back with her husband, Dr. G. Ramachandran, and set the seeds for the Gandhi Gram a Rural University, but also the entire Gandhi Gram complex. Um, it was also then, I think, she started uh, looking at the public health problems of India a little bit more closer. Um, and, and I would like to then move forward. I will describe this a little later, but I would like to move forward to the year 1962. It was a very important year for Dr. Soundram. She was invited by the then Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, to come and become a Union Minister for Education. And during her tenure as Minister, she did two important things. I only found that out through research. I was helped tremendously um, by uh, Ms. Ramya Devraj, who's interning at the ashram, and Dr. Surya Kanti, with these materials that are available online, but also in the wonderful archives of Gandhi Gram. And Dr. Sandram, wrote the policy brief and ensured that primary education would be free for, ch for the children of India. And this was a tremendous legacy that she left behind. She knew education would be life transforming. She knew that the progress of India would be inseparable from the educational experience and the early educational experience of the children of India. The other thing that she did, and she was already thinking of higher education, she integrated the spirit of service. She knew government could not do everything alone. So she integrated this spirit of service into what she developed and helped develop, the national service scheme. I was so inspired to, to, to read from the research that I received that 3.8 Six million young people are part of this. Young Indian boys and girls are part of it. Look what happens when in the midst of your higher education, you're constantly invited to reflect on the application and the application of your knowledge and leadership and expertise in the service of others. Um, Dr. Sandram, of course, was then honored by the government of India and the people of India with the Padma Bhushan. Not only the Padma Bhushan, I think each one of us who have had a chance to hear her, see her, read her, and benefit from her work, honor her in our hearts um, with the kind of respect that she richly and rightly deserves. You know, I'd also like to rewind to 1980. It's linked to me and it's linked to Gandhi Gram. My father became the second vice chancellor of the Gandhi Gram University, Dr. M. Aram. Besides the many things he did uh, during his time in Gandhi Gram, he also introduced my brother Ashok and me to party. As a young girl, I absorbed her, I absorbed from her, I observed her. I saw that the problems of India in her mind did not stop as problems. They were always to be solved with the faith that we had, the expertise, but also the spirit to do so. I continue to draw from that. But let me now go to, I think, what I uh, consider two important dimensions of her leadership and it has relevance to the way that we can shape ourselves as leaders for the future. One is her leadership experience and the second is the public health uh, experiments. I've already alluded to the leadership model uh, that has roots in her personal life as well as her journey in the freedom struggle of India and post-independence in creating these models. The closest 
that comes to my mind to her leadership experience is this wonderful theoretical construction of transformational leadership that are taught in business schools, in schools of public health, they're taught in schools of diplomacy, where there is a space for, in, for idealized influence. There's an idealized influence that the person houses, but the person also draws from the work of the day, the intellectual stimulation. There is inspiration, it's not sterile uh, knowledge alone, there's inspiration, it's alive. And then what they do is they bring it to, uh, to individuals who can then become instruments of change. But I think Dr. Saundram added her own to this wonderful model of transformational leadership. She found space for the individual. Remember, she herself had a wonderful trajectory of growth and development and evolution, and she found space for society collectively. But in the midst of it, they were in this intersection, there was also the focus, as Mahatma Gandhi always said, of internal change, that if you did not reflect inwards, answer the question that made you a better human being you could never uh, extend that to uh, to the way that you wanted to impact society so I'd like all of us uh, who are together for this oration to remember this that there is job to be done inside we need to grow inside but there is work to be done outside our comfort zones you know and as I look at leadership again I'm, I'm reminded of this wonderful talisman of Mahatma Gandhi which is inscribed in the walls of Rajkhat where Gandhi remains still inspire us and there he says um, recall the face of the poorest the last and the least and if your work has an impact it will change their lives for the better go ahead and do what you do I think party looked at this quote every single day every single day Dr. Sandram lived a day uh, the, the day but also I think her life with purpose and here is where I want to transition to the next part of my presentation and there's so much you can see alive in Gandhi Gram. I encourage everyone who's interested to know more about Dr. Sandram to go and visit Gandhi Gram. spend a couple of days absorb and soak in what she did there but for this presentation I want to speak about um, two things that I think are, are, are ten and our compelling presentations of her public health um, work. One was, I think, this whole idea of maternal and child health. Remember, it was in its nascent stage, looking at the mother and the child together. And the second was really public health modeling, you know, creating models that the world could adapt to. Um, we must not forget India is still home to the largest number of child marriages. Girls married off before the age of 18. It was very bad in 1940. It continues to be a statistic that should haunt our conscience even in 2020. She also knew not only were girls married off before the age of 18, there was a, a very basic problem in Indian society, which is the skewed sex ratio. Normally, biology tells us for a thousand boys, there should be more than a thousand girls. Various reasons, cultural preference of the boy, male child. Uh, many of these have contributed to the negative sex ratio. Professor Amartya Sen calls them the missing girls that India must have had in their families and in its, uh, and its society. Now she knew that there was this problem, the preference of the male child, and she knew that girls were marrying uh, before 18, and so the birthing experience was very unsafe. A number of young girls were dying at birth. So there came the seeds of the Kasturba hospital, um, where she made it safe for women to have uh, their deliveries, their newborns were taken care of. So that again, another big public health problem of that time, which is less now in India, infant mortality, neonatal mortality, childhood mortality, those data could be significantly changed and, and, and the models could be presented. She of course knew it was not enough to work in the hospital alone. She used the socio-economic um, determinants of health as her, as her drive. Uh, and, and went to the villages around Gandhi Gram, uh, to, to Chinalapati and to Chetiapati and to Atur block and to Nadupati and to Vedasindur and said let's build good houses, let's bring water supply, let's improve education and she was presenting in the process the model, the integrated model to India as to what could actually influence health deeply. 
It was in this context, I remember, as a 10-year-old being picked up every Sunday in her beautiful black Fiat car and, and, and allowing me the experience to observe her. And in one of those Sunday visits, she whispered into my ears, all of 10, health for all. I probably did not comprehend the full scope of it, but today I understand it's not just an aspiration. It was an action plan that she presented to everybody everybody healthcare providers uh, and, and experts from every field to to integrate into their action plans but when i speak of health the public health um, experiments must also include another problem of that day and that was the demographic problem remember the word the phrase population bomb um, in the 70s everybody was talking about this population bomb that would explode in india she knew sterilization and contraceptives were not the only solutions in, in stabilizing population she knew education is a far superior contraceptive and so she focused and she continued what she did as a as a union minister the focus on education the Gandhigram Rural University the 10,000 students today and the many thousand students who have moved out of Gandhigram each of you are a recipient of that vision each of you have the possibility of contributing to this legacy but i must say along with this i saw something that was so rare and so unique and so beautiful that dr soundram did she encouraged young women to become leaders it was not the order of the day she created in her ecosystem thousands of young leaders her focus on women was was centered around human dignity my mother mrs minoti aram was a recipient of that love and that nurture dr pankajam who has who has uh, initiated this oration is a recipient. Um, Dr. Surya Kanti, who helped me research uh, for this, is a recipient. So many of them were direct recipients of this leadership lesson um, and the encouragement um, to take leadership roles. You know, I'm reminded of another leadership model, which is leadership by the chair. And I hope every young girl who's listening to this oration, every young woman and every young man who's listening to this reflection this morning will remember that these lessons are not just to be learned and analyzed these lessons are to be lived let my balance sheet and I say this to me all, all the time let my balance sheet have innumerable number of girls who can say I can lead I'm confident to give my best to society and this is where I think I come to the final part of my presentation which is what are the lessons that we can integrate into our learning but also into our life I think the first one is the problem solving model she presented the integrated rural development model as a problem solved model a problem solving model that problems have to be analyzed but more importantly we have to find composite solutions together so that these problems can change um, as, as we go forward she also I think very beautifully linked theory and practice every single work of her was informed by theory but also I think deeply influenced by what she saw on ground I also find in her I think a, a tremendous example of how policy and practice can be dynamically linked um, and this is something for our generation that we don't see them in compartments but we see them together because we will respect people on the front lines the COVID-19 pandemic has seen our theory is only as good as practice so this conversation and dialogue with people on the front lines as well as conversations with people who can push the frontiers of knowledge is so important of course um, uh, Dr. Soundram also presented to us an expanded classroom. Uh, she presented to us the rationale behind inclusive societies, whether it was working for women, it was working for uh, our Harijan brothers and sisters, whether it was working with the elite. She knew inclusive uh, societies would require everybody's participation. And let's not forget what she also did. She always reminded us, don't accept status quo. Critical thinking was her companion throughout life, whether it was in her personal life, of marrying, remarrying, studying and leading, or it was in her professional life. I think those are important things to take. She was never afraid of working at any level. Individuals were worthy of her attention, institutions were worthy of her investment. Same thing I think what she did was she brought Mahatma Gandhi alive for me. I had never seen Mahatma Gandhi, but in her work and my father's work and in their generation's work, I saw Mahatma Gandhi's vision of Sarvodaya, Sarva Udayam, the progress of everybody alive. And I think as I work with children, I know children don't accept what you say. Children accept what you live. She led by example. And therefore with all of this, 
she became the inspiration that we hold for our generation but I'm sure for generations to come so I hope you will enjoy this multifaceted personality her life her legacy her leadership both as something to be celebrated but something that can we can adapt into our own life and and carry forward I have to say that preparing for this oration I had thought of my father many 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 times he was the vice chancellor I saw him taking Gandhigram University to the next Next level how he had done what dr. Soundram had done brought another generation of leaders into deep service uh, of their of, of, of the community around them but also helping them grow I also think of Appa and, so, and, and see how he brought the best of the world's thinking and expertise into high quality work for the community and he took from Gandhi Grama model that was integrated into the new education policy of India um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ram Appa, as I call him, Anna, as many of you call him, said education is meant for everybody. Leaders and masses, elite, children, adults, everybody. And he meant education in the broad sense of the term, where we could understand not only science and math and language and literature, but also understand that this is a shared destiny. Together we progress and divided we fall. This was his call. This was his call always. He said a creative person is a positive force. And I hope this oration will stimulate you to think creatively, to expand your footprint and to do what you should do so that the next generation will say it's a life well lived. I thank Gandhigram University for this wonderful opportunity. And to all of you, I have a request. Please go back and think about what you can do. Please go to Gandhigram sometime. Please look at the resources that are available online and in the libraries and archives of Gandhigram so that you may understand Dr. Soundram and her generation better. It's an absolute honor for me to deliver this oration and I must say I have been moved and I have been encouraged to see my life with a deeper purpose as I deliver this oration. Thank you very much.